Hello, welcome to Let's Learn Physics. Join me as I read my physics textbooks, catching up on what I learned in grad school, and explaining it to curious minds like you. Last time we learned about Poisson brackets, how they simplify physics problems, and the conceptual insights they give us about symmetry and conservation if we look at them with the generator interpretation. Today, we're going to bite the mathematical bullet and learn how to change coordinates using generating functions which are completely different things from generators, so don't get them mixed up. Generators go into Poisson brackets and tell us about rates of change. Generating functions are math tools we can use to change coordinates. Once we do that, we'll jump into chapter 10 to learn a technique to solve physics problems just by changing coordinates cleverly. Fair warning, this will be a very math heavy video, which is why I decided to make it separate from the main chapter 9 and 10 videos. I recommend having a working knowledge of advanced calculus and partial differential equations before attempting to understand this video. Conceptually, this video boils down to, for any physical system, there's a process for transforming any set of valid canonical coordinates and their conjugate momenta into any other valid set of canonical coordinates and their conjugate momenta. That process is called a canonical transformation. Let's start by contemplating how we want to represent a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. This would be like a spring whose resting point is at the origin, and if it gets stretched in any direction, it pulls back toward the origin. If you've taken college physics, you might think of Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates, and we can transform between them by thinking of x and y as the sides of a right triangle, and r and theta as the hypotenuse and angle. These are the equations that let us transform from x and y to r and theta. We also need to transform the momentum. For the r momentum, that is the momentum in the direction toward or away from the origin, we can dot product the momentum with the displacement unit vector. For the theta momentum, we can use the angular momentum, which comes from the cross product of the displacement and the momentum. When we transform a physical system's coordinates, we also have to transform its Hamiltonian into these coordinates. But here's what our 2D harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian looks like in X and Y coordinates, and here's what it looks like in our theta coordinates. We've got kinetic energy terms and a potential energy term. As a side note, there's no theta in K. So if we Poissonate K with the angular momentum, we get zero which means in this system, the starting angle doesn't matter and angular momentum is conserved. That's not important for today's lesson, but I thought it was an interesting application of last time. So we can write down this transformation because we've memorized it from college physics, but what's the process for figuring this out and how can we do it for any set of coordinates? The derivation goes back to the idea of action. We've learned before that the Hamiltonian follows the path of stationary action represented by this integral, and the transformed Hamiltonian does as well. For these both to be true, this mathematical equation has to hold true. That lambda is just a scale factor, and it doesn't change the physics at all, so we can just set it equal to 1. But look here, we have a derivative df dt. What is this, and why are we adding it? It is any function of the canonical coordinates and time. And we're allowed to add it because the variation in it is zero, which means it doesn't contribute to the action. So what is this f and how can we use it? f is called a generating function. It has no physical interpretation, but we can choose it to be whatever it needs to be so that we can transform one set of coordinates into another. It can be a function of any combination of canonical coordinates and time even different sets of canonical coordinates. Suppose we decide it's only a function of the unchanged coordinates, the changed coordinates, and time, and not the momenta. Why are we calling this F1? I'll explain it a bit. In the Hamiltonian transformation equation, F1's time derivative appears. If we foil it out with the chain rule, it becomes this. The Q dot terms are linearly independent, so we can separate them into separate equations. These equations tell us how to transform the momenta and the Hamiltonian. We now have enough equations to find the new coordinates and momenta in terms of the old and the transformed Hamiltonian in terms of the new. The process goes like this. Given the generating function, find the old and new momenta in terms of the old and new coordinates. Invert the old momentum equation to find the new coordinates in terms of the old coordinate set. 
substitute into the transformation equations to find the new momentum in terms of the old coordinate set, invert these to find the old coordinates and momenta in terms of the new coordinates and momenta, substitute to find the old Hamiltonian in terms of the new coordinates and momenta, dfdt in terms of the new coordinates and momenta, and thus the new Hamiltonian in terms of the new coordinates and momenta. Thus, if you know the generating function, you can find the new coordinates and Hamiltonian. But it works the other way too. Given a coordinate transformation, you can find the generating function. The process goes, given the new coordinates and momenta in terms of the old, you invert the equations to find the new and old momenta in terms of the new and old coordinates. Then you insert them into the transformation equations, which can be solved as coupled differential equations to give you F1. So why do we call this F1? Well, it turns out there's an equivalent process for functions of every combination of the new and old coordinates and momenta. As long as one is new and the other is old, it works. And there's four possible pairings of new and old like this. Actually, it's also possible to use generating functions that mix having some new coordinates, some old coordinates, some new momenta, and some old momenta as long as each one is paired from one of the set of the other. Hopefully, if that doesn't make sense, the function on screen clears it up. Here's a table of the types given in the textbook, along with their associated equations and a simple example of each. The Hamiltonian transformation equation sounds important, but really it's only used to derive this process. From now on, we won't need it. We'll just follow the steps. Let's try it on our 2D harmonic oscillator. We'll use the polar coordinate transformations to find the generating function. We'll use the generating function that has the opposite of these variables, in this case F3, with R, theta, Px, and Py. Here are the four partial derivatives to solve for our generating function. We substitute our transformation equation into these. Let's do it one at a time. X is R cosine theta. We take the antiderivative, or indefinite integral, and get f3 equals minus px r cosine theta, plus a constant. And because f3 is a multivariable function, the constant is actually a function of the other three variables. To find that constant, we have to do the other integrals and compare the answers. The y equation looks almost the same, but with py and sine. The pr integral is also very similar. The last one is p theta. Now, theta is inside the sine and cosine, which makes it a little different from before, but if you know your calculus rules, the integrals are also very simple. Now that we have all four solutions, we compare them to see how they match up. The last two are the same, and the first two slot into them nicely, so we're good. And that is our generating function. Since it doesn't depend explicitly on time, we can find our new Hamiltonian just by changing variables, which gives us radial kinetic energy plus rotational kinetic energy plus spring potential energy. That's the end of the chapter 9 part of our discussion. Let's review what we've learned. For any classical system, we can transform between canonical bases using this equation, which is derived from the least action principle. Expanding the generating function derivative gives us multiple equations. If we know the generating function, we can transform the coordinates and the Hamiltonian. If we know the transformation of coordinates, we can find the generating function. There are four types of generating functions to choose from, based on what's easiest for the physical system in question. The generating function has no physical significance, it's just a math tool. Alright, now it's time to move on to chapter 10. Now that we know how to change coordinates, a new method opens up to solve physics problems. The Hamilton-Jacobi method. If the Hamiltonian is conserved, that is, has a constant value, we can transform into a new set of coordinates such that that value of the Hamiltonian is zero. According to the Hamiltonian equations of motion, that means our new coordinates and momenta must be constant. Hold on a minute. If the coordinates and momenta are constant, doesn't that mean nothing happens in this system? Not so. Ever since episode one of this series, we've been talking about how generalized coordinates, the Q's, don't have to be positioned. They can be any combination of scalar properties of this system. Speed, frequency, energy, anything. So therefore, a system with a conserved Hamiltonian and n degrees of freedom has two n constants which fulfill the requirements of canonical coordinates and momenta. 
Because the Hamilton equations of motion are trivial with these constants, the solution to the system is expressing the coordinates that do change in terms of the constant coordinates that don't. We just learned earlier in the video how to transform coordinates. We use a generator function and the transformation equation and set the transformed Hamiltonian to zero. For this particular problem, we use generating function two with variable coordinates and constant momenta. From the generator equations, the variable momenta are df dq. Putting this into the transformation equation, we get this, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It's customary in this process to write f2 as s, called Hamilton's principal function. It turns out to be the indefinite action of the system. To solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, we need to know what the Hamiltonian is and substitute in the coordinate derivative of s for the momentum. Then we solve the differential equation for s. By the way, if the Hamiltonian does not depend explicitly on time, we can simplify this generating function s of uh, q, alpha, and t as w of q and alpha, not depending on time, minus a constant times time. w is called Hamilton's characteristic function, or the abbreviated action. The transformation equation tells us the constant q's in terms of s. We invert it to find the variable coordinate in terms of the constants in time, and substitute the result into one of the transformation equations to find the variable momenta in terms of the constants in time. These variable coordinates and momenta as functions of the constant in time are the solution to the physical problem. They tell us how the system changes over time. Let's follow along with section 10.2's example of the harmonic oscillator. Yes, we're doing the harmonic oscillator again. It's such a versatile physical system. It's so amazing that we can learn so many physics methods by applying them to this one system. The Hamiltonian is kinetic plus potential energy. We've done this before, let's just write it out. We also know it's constant if the system isn't driven or damped, and that constant is the total energy. We use the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and rewrite the momentum in terms of the action derivative. Since the Hamiltonian doesn't depend explicitly on time, s equals w minus alpha t, and its partial time derivative is minus alpha. This changes the Hamilton-Jacobi equation to look like this. Since the left side is just the Hamiltonian, alpha naught must be the energy. Solving for w, we get this. To get s, we just subtract alpha t. This could be integrated in principle, but because beta equals the derivative of s with respect to alpha, the book thinks it's easier to do that derivative first. If you're a math whiz, you can do this integral. I looked up the answer on the next line of the textbook. The solution is the inverse sine function. Inverting it for q, we get a sine function with time. These parts are all constant, so we can simplify them and compare them to the harmonic oscillator equation we learned in college physics. To find the momentum, we take dw dq, which is easy because it just undoes the integral. We substitute in the q function and do algebra, and find a result that squares with our understanding of the velocity equation from college physics. Now that we've seen the Hamilton-Jacobi method working on a harmonic oscillator, we can think about applying it to a two-dimensional separable harmonic oscillator. Separable means the x and y coordinates oscillate separately, which I believe was not true for our earlier example. Hang on, let me check real quick. Actually, no, looking at this Hamiltonian, it is exactly the same as our previous example, so forget what I just said. The book does the whole thing, and the process is exactly the same as the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. It ends with the discussion of the phase difference between the two dimensions, represented by the betas, or initial angles. If they're the same, the system moves back and forth on a diagonal line. If they're slightly different, the system traces out an ellipse. And if they're 90 degrees out of phase, the system traces a circle. The last thing I want to talk about today is a slight variation on the Hamilton-Jacobi process from section 10.3 on Hamilton's characteristic function, w. When the Hamiltonian does not depend explicitly on time, we can use w in the Hamilton-Jacobi equation like we did for the harmonic oscillator. The process leads us to coordinates that change at a constant rate in time. We use the letter v for velocity. In our harmonic oscillator, v was the angular frequency, and big Q was everything inside the sign. If there are multiple coordinates, we can express one of them this way, and the rest in terms of that first coordinate. Astronomical orbits work this way. 
We saw back in chapter 3 that we can write r in terms of theta, or for instance, a planet's distance from the sun in terms of its angle in its orbit. We'll go into this method next video when we, more conceptually, go into action angle variables. Today, we waded into the weeds of transforming coordinates. Without these methods, we might be able to pencil and paper certain coordinate transformations like Cartesian to polar or spherical to cylindrical, but from this deep dive into abstract mathematics, we have discovered a method to transform any set of coordinates for any physical system into any other. We then jumped into chapter 10 to learn how we can use the Hamilton-Jacobi method to solve physical problems just by transforming coordinates cleverly. That's it for today. You may have noticed that this video came out a lot sooner after part 9 than part 9 came out after part 8. Part of the reason is because before I did part 9, I had to read all this stuff and learn it just so I could decide where to set the boundaries of the videos. As you know, I ended up deciding to put Poisson brackets as their own video, and I was going to skip these canonical transformations. However, I believe they're very, very important for understanding physics at a highly technical level. So instead of doing one video for chapter 9 and one video for chapter 10, I decided to split it up into three, where I would do one that's more conceptual, chapter 9, one that's more conceptual, chapter 10, and one that really gets into the math. So I hope that you found this enjoyable and interesting and valuable. Let me know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe and hit the bell if you'd like to be notified when more of my videos come out. If you have extra cash lying around and you think what I do is valuable, you can support me on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.